Hi there, I'm Tony Glynn and welcome to the PGG Rights and Stud Tour. Now this week we're at Harriet in West Otago. We're catching up with Alan and Sonia Richardson here at Avalon Genetics. These guys are breeding Perindales, Texels and a new low input, high performance breed called the Ultimate. It's a beautiful property, let's go and have a look around. Alan Richardson, you're farming here near Harriet with your wife Sonia. Whereabouts exactly are we, Alan? We're about 8 k's west of, of Harriet, up yep. in the hills. Where just behind us here is the Spilor Valley, looking out into the White Cones. So the mountains behind us are about 4,500 feet. Yeah, and the scale of the place here and the, and the stock units here? We're running, uh, we've got two properties running uh, about 1,300 hectares, running about 14,500 stock units. That's about 11.5 stock units the hectare. So, yeah, we're reasonably well stocked up for this, the average around the, the area. And the breeds on the place? The Perindol base, uh, Perindol ewes, we've had them all the way through, and Angus cows. So also you're organic now, Alan, and have been so for quite some time, is that right? We have, yeah, we've been farming organically for the last 14 years, so, you know, we're in it for the long haul. Um, and it's, it's a way of farming, it's a different production system. Yeah. And and I think sometimes people get a wee bit carried away with the word organic. It's for us it's a different farming production system where there's some things we can do and some things we can't. At the end of the day um, we're still farming yeah. and the basics are still the same. A lot of people still have a bad perception out there of organics and probably boo hoo it a bit and what yeah. do you think of that? Yeah, I think that's that's true and, and sometimes that's through um, people seeing it as a threat. Other cases it may be the uh, lack of information, I'm not sure, but I think it's about time to, to lay those, some of those um, stories to bed. Um, organics can be very productive, you know, we're turning out 18k lambs organically now. Yeah. Um, if you take away the storms that we've had the last two years down here, 140% um, lambing, and um, at a, a striking rate above the, the average around the, this area. So, you know, that's serious production and um, look at some of the, the better farmers and see what they're doing, yeah. judge us on them. A lot of theories out there, people might say about the organics, Yeah, that you just can't run the same amount of stock units or, you know, cost your fortune to actually even try it. What do you think? I would certainly disagree with those, especially the, the stocking rate. We've maintained our stocking rate the whole way through during our conversion over these years and it's now going, going up. And the other thing is, each year our production is going up too. Yeah. If this sort of farming is not sustainable, our production would be going down. And, and the grass that we've seen over the last couple of days, you know, it wouldn't be there. Yeah. Um, so there's no reason why your organic farming can't be as productive, if not more productive, than conventional farming. Yeah. And getting a good premium on those lambs for the organic side of things? Yeah, we are. Look, um, we, through Silver Fern Farms, we're getting $8 a K and for a three-year fixed contract. So that's serious money. Yeah. in anyone's book. You know, to know what you're getting three years out, that's yeah. pretty, pretty But they've special. got a preferred weight range there? Yeah, they have. It, it's a 15k through to about a 23k. Yeah. So, you know, there's plenty of room there. Yeah. And and when we started off organic farming, we were happy to get a 13.5k carcass. We're now uh, probably going to average around 17.5, 18k's for the season. So, you know, we, we haven't reached our potential yet. We've been at it for 14 years, but we probably didn't take a great hit early on because we'd already been selecting for worm resistance in our sheep, and that's really how we got into organics. We had a sheep that could actually perform yeah. and, without drenching. Yeah. And so there wasn't the drop off, and, and that's probably why some people do fall on their backsides organically, because um, they've got the wrong genetics. Yeah. They've got high input genetics that all of a sudden they go cold turkey, yeah. and the wheels fall off. And um, you know, luckily we didn't have to go through that. Yeah. Now, about this, uh, the worm resistance, tell us a little bit about what you, your program is there. Yeah, we were, back in um, 1998, we were the third farmer uh, in New Zealand to start testing for worm resistance. And uh, it was new technology then, And but back then we could see that an animal that didn't need to be drenched, there's something pretty special about that. Yeah. And that became part of our focus, production plus the worm resistance. And yeah, it's not a glamour job. Yeah. It's not the sort of thing you put in your CV, but it's um, it's worked for us, and we're now at the stage where we've got a highly resistant flock, yeah. and allows us to farm uh, organically and, and do it do it easily. With the, all that work that you've done on the worm resistance, is, is there any tie up there with external parasites? 
Yeah, there, there is. Uh, we, we believe that there is a, a crossover between the internal and the external. Uh, we don't dip here, and um, what we find is that our more resistant animals have also got less lice. Yeah. Um, part of that too is, is making sure they're fed well. Yeah. But um, no, lice f for us is not an issue. Now I believe you're the only stud guy or farmer doing any work with the uh, FE tolerance here in the South Island. Is that right? That's right. Um, there's certainly no facial eczema down here, Tony. But we do sell rams into the, the hot spots in the North Island. Yeah. And uh, we've been doing the, the FE t ram guard test for the last ten years. Yeah. And, and why? Why? Because uh, there is a tie-up between worm resistance again and, um, and facial eczema tolerance. Yep. And it seems to be that the, the higher the worm resistance, the more tolerance they have. Yep. It's not a straight line, but most of the individuals fall under that sort of category. Yeah. Do you think we'll get it down here? Like it's come to Nelson, isn't it? Well, the feel of the day today, we could. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it, it, it may be one that gets you one year in, in seven in, in Canterbury or something like that. Yeah. But, you know, one year in seven would be enough, wouldn't it? So, yeah. you know, what we're doing is, is future-proofing our, our clients, yeah. production base, and, and uh, you know, uh, it's part of that add-on of what we do for yeah. our clients. Kim Robinson here at uh, Lock Hill Farmlands. Whereabouts exactly are we, Kim? Uh, Glen Murray, half an hour south of Pukekohe, uh, west north of Hamilton, or an hour out of Auckland. So. Nice big property here. How big, how big is it? Uh, it's about 7,500 acres, and... We run about 42,000 stock units, depending on whether it rains or it doesn't. Yeah. Um, probably 50-50 sheep and beef. Um, put 10,500 ewes to the ram this year. So now you've been working in a little bit with Alan Richardson there. Long way to go to buy rams. Yeah, it is, yeah. But I'm hopping a big bird and you're down there in a couple of hours and yeah. an hour in the car, so it's no good. Down or back in the one day normally. Yeah. yeah. We wanted to give the Perindales a shot. We have a a lot of problem here with uh, death rate, very humid in the summertime and um, early autumn. Yeah. So we uh, wanted a sheep with a real tough constitution and they, he's, um, he's doing a lot of work on worms and resistance, that sort of thing. Um, so trying not to drench as much. Yeah. And he's thinking outside the square and um, he treats them yeah, pretty pretty harshly really, yeah. um, he doesn't pamper them which is what we like. So what are, what are the main sort of challenges you're facing in this area? I think um, the eczema of course is, is the, the key thing but you can, people are doing some work on that as Alan is, and, um, but the other one is, is viral pneumonia and, and they've tried to get vaccines and stuff but it's it's pretty much it changes, the virus changes each mm. year and it's it's bloody hard and that gives us a hammering. and. Yeah. I think he, he's just breeding a, a good tough sheep yeah. and I think that's helping us and, and that's what we're sort of, we're, the road we're going down, we just want a, a tougher sheep is what we're aiming for. Bit of history here Alan. Yeah there is a bit of history, it's um, built in the, about the 1880s. Um, the road just up here was the old road to the, the Waikai gold mine so in its time would have been a pretty flash sort of shack and say. So. Yeah, was this a sort of a stopover point before the... Yeah, well, I guess so, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, certainly not our ancestors, but good Scottish ancestry. Your father was a fairly good farmer, they tell me, Alan. Yeah, he was. He was a, a very successful conventional farmer in his day. And it, he was a guy that started with nothing. He was a city boy and got his first break onto a farm. And, and from that, he did very well. He developed a, a low-cost system and Perindale sheep and developed and was able to purchase more. So, yeah, he did very well. Yeah. farming. He loved it. It was his passion. Yeah. And what was it, what was his views on the organic side of things? Yeah, well, that's a good question because it actually put um, our relationship under a bit of pressure. But for him, organics or what he thought of organics was turning the clock back. Yeah. Um, whereas what we believed organics was was a modern modern way of working with um, nature, and but with the marketing edge. So yeah. it wasn't just about the, the production side. It was actually looking where those products were going. Yeah, yeah. So you think he'd be fairly happy to see what you're doing now? Yeah. With the farmland? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I hope that he'd be very proud. He passed away last year, but he's, um, you know, he, hopefully he would see, well, yeah, the production's still there. We're the next generation, and, and James is the generation after him, so it's about looking after the land and, and making sure that the next generation gets an opportunity, just yeah. like I did. 
James Richardson, you've been working here at Avalon for quite a few years now. How old are you, James? Nine. You're nine, and you've you're uh, you got into the into the sheep business yourself. How, how many ewes have you bought now? Um, twenty. You bought twenty ewes. Yeah, and you paid for those with your wages. Yep. Well, that's not too bad. So, so what does Dad reckon about this getting you into the studs? Um, he reckons it, it's pretty good. If I start early, I'll get heaps more experience. So, what school are you at, James? Um, here at school. A few kids down there. Yep. You're the only one down there that owns his own sheep. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Better sell them some chops at lunchtime. Yeah. Yeah. So, what have you guys been up to today, James? Um. Me, Dad and Murray, we were um, putting colours on sheep's backs so we can find out which rams they go to, so to get the best ram to go with the best mare. Yeah. So they don't go, if they're like a sister, they don't go with their brother. Yeah, you don't want that business going on, do you? No. Uh, so that's been keeping you busy for a few days here in the yards? Yeah. So I saw a small line of not bad looking ewes heading away on a truck this morning. They're not off to the works, are they? No, I, I hope not. I hope not, Tony. They're, oh, that's good. they're heading down to Mount Linton Station down there, 20 Texel ewes, and they're going to a, a top Texel ram down there. Yeah. One of the pro one of the issues, I suppose, we have with low input farming is there's very few genetics around the country that can actually come here and handle our environment. So we put them under a lot of pressure, and uh, Mount Linton is probably one of the places where they can handle that sort of pressure when they come here. So it's good to get those genetics and and hopefully um, get some good links and also um, get a good couple of good um, size out of it. You talk about it being challenging bringing the other stock here onto this place. Are we talking yeah. climate uh, challenge-wise? or Because yeah. it's a fairly nice looking country, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, it certainly is today. Look, it's it's the total package, really. Um, the number one challenge for a sheep is parasite challenge. And the fact that we're not drenching, um, you know, none of our, our female stock get drenched at all yeah. uh, throughout their lifetime now. So that puts a lot of challenge on an animal. Yeah. And, and probably... When you look at the, um, some of the drier environments around the country, some are dry, that's tremendous stock health country because um, the parasite challenge is a lot lower. So we, we get maximum challenges uh, during the, the summer autumn yeah. when animals are supposed to be growing. And so animals um, that perform under those sort of challenges uh, are doing really well. You know, growing but also fighting those parasites. So uh, that's uh, the issue that we have to farm with and um, if we have a really dry season like some of the people in North Otago or Canterbury have most summers, that's when we have our best stock health because the parasite challenge is taken away. So the animals that can perform here and have a really low feck under a high challenge and no dags under a high challenge, those animals will be dag free wherever they go. And the ultimates, I don't know if I've heard of an ultimate. An ultimate is a breed that we've developed over the years since 2004. Uh, we've worked uh, with Dave Scobie, the Ag Research, uh, a wee bit there, and uh, it's, it's a, a low-input, high-performance breed based around the parent on the Texel. Yep. It's, um, it's got a wee bit of fin in there, and we've stabilised that, and it's um, a breed which we're really excited about. Now, you're testing for quite a few traits here, aren't you, Alan? What are some of the other things you're looking at? Yeah, we're, we're looking at the, the meat quality and obviously the um, meat yields and that's so we've put animals through the CT scanners yeah. so we're taking it from that front but also from the low input side uh, that's really been a focus for us and by that the DAGs, DAG scores, we've been doing the DAG scores as long as we've done the, the FEC sampling yeah. so that's really important. Why do farmers get out of farming? Probably one of the main reasons because they hate DAGing sheep. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> You know, we want to attack that. But let's go further than that. Let's have a sheep that doesn't need drenched or dagged. Yeah. Or very rarely. Yeah. And so that's good. From the low input side, we're also starting to score our ultimate breed on tail length because we're leaving the tails on them. Um, so we want a short tail. We want a nice bare breech in all our animals, be it texels, perindos, or ultimates. And the other thing is um, the belly wool. You know, the points, there's no money in those. It takes a lot to, to shear them. Yeah. And... Uh, Let's take them out. Let's keep the fleece, but uh, let's leave all those points behind. Makes good sense. So it might take quite a few years, Alan, but do you think you might get to no tailing at all? Oh, certainly, certainly. That's part of our vision, to have a, a flock that we don't need to tail. And and tail length is um, very heritable. It, it's at 80%. You know, if you compare that with selecting for fleece or growth rates at about 30% yeah. best, you know, it's highly heritable, and so we can make real progress in that very quickly. I think what people remember is, is the long tailor that gets away at tailing time. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's it's got wool around it, um, right around the tail, and it's down to its ankles. Yeah. Um, that's a hiding for nothing. Uh, there's no way that we're we're breeding something like that. Yeah. This has got no wool on the the underside, and um, very little wool on the top of the tail. So let's throw it all in the mix there. We've we've got the no tails and the belly's gone, the air feed tolerance, the whole deal that you that you're doing here. What are we ending up with? We're ending up with an animal which uh, we think is uh, the future of the industry. Phil Gray up here in North Canterbury, whereabouts are we, Phil? Uh, we're in Wire. Um, it's about an hour and a half north of Christchurch and just over the hill from Hamlet Springs. Stock-wise, what are you running on the place here, Phil? We've just got over a thousand ewes, um, about 350 replacement ewe lambs, and we've got about 85 cattle, which we keep the progeny right through to finishing. How long have you been working in with Alan? We would have been a um, good seven years. Yeah. Um, start off with some Perindale, Perindale Texel crosses, and um, with Alan developing his ultimates, we're, we're finding they fit the bill very well for us. Long term, we're looking for uh, really easy care sheep um, yeah. and try and have virtually no dags, um, just keeps the, the fly issue down. It's... Uh, even though we find the fly issue's really gone away, really, with, yeah. with these rams. And, uh, so, yeah, long term, it's a, um, a better proposition to have a clean land. So you've been working with, with the sheep there with the short tails for a while. Obviously, if it didn't work for you, you would have whacked them off by now. Yeah, we still um, take some off for the ewe lambs. Uh, ram lambs, we've been leaving them on and, and playing around there. Um, and we're finding that's been working quite well, leaving the tails on. Um, some of the, uh, possibly some of the longer ones we might get a bit fussy and just take off, but yeah. we're finding the short tails are starting to come through now and, and they've been no issue at all. Callum McDonald, you're with PGG Wrightsons down here in Southland. Now you've had a fair bit to do with Alan Richardson yep. and Sonia up there at Avalon, taking a few clients here over the years. Yeah, no, we've had uh, clients that have bought rams here and uh, they're happy with the results. Uh, they seem to have uh, a low low cost sort of operation with, uh, you know, still um, have good growth rates and stuff like that. So, yeah, everyone's fairly happy, yeah. It's been a mixed season, but, uh, you know, things are looking good up there. And, yeah, it's a testament to the stock and, and to the Alan and Sonia themselves, yeah. yeah. So, Callum, it's it's not a quick process to breed the ultimate sheep if there's such a thing as the ultimate sheep? No, no, I mean, it's a, it's a long process and it takes a lot of time and effort. And, and uh, yeah, I mean... Breeders like Alan and Sonia, it's, it takes years of improvements and trying things, and yeah, they, they're doing all the behind the scenes work that uh, you know goes into breeding a sheep like that. So, organic farming doesn't suit everybody, Callum. No, it doesn't. But uh, I think if you, if you set up for it and um, you've got the right uh, mentality, you, you know, you can make big inroads. And uh, yeah, the, the reduction in costs has got to be a got to be a good thing moving forward. Yeah, if you can get that premium for your meat and still run just as much stock there, she's yep. good. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And, uh, you know, I think what Alan and Sonia are doing down there um, is is trying to achieve that, yeah. So, Robin, how do you see things on the organic side of things from your point of view? Well, organics is foreign to me. I have had associations with the science investment in, in farming for a long, long time, and and the organics is, is kind of the, the, the antithesis of that. So... Uh, it, it's just just uh, uh, foreign to my background, but I come here and I see the results that he is getting, and and they are too good to deny. Yeah. So I have to say, oh well, Alan, it's not the way I would do it, but I can see that it's working for you. Yeah. So uh, organics aside, you'd be here in an advisory capacity with the genetics anyway. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And uh, and it's sheep performance that is important to me. Uh, it, it's sheep performance that I'm here to to promote. And they go very well. Yeah. Uh, Alan does very well uh, in cross-flock analysis. And while his sheep might look a bit smaller, uh, um, not as well finished as they would on a conventional farm, when they go to a conventional farm, and I see them after they've been there for a while, that they're absolute star performers. They look brilliant. Yeah. And I assume that that's because they've come off such a, a hard, a challenging environment on the organic property. When they go to a conventional property, it's like they're on holiday. So, Robin, do you think if, if a farmer went to, to their bank manager and said, right, I'm going to stop putting super on, I'm going to stop drenching the lambs, and that the old, for the initial stage of, of going organic, the old bank manager might get his hackles up a bit? 
Well, they, they might uh, be a little bit nervous. Uh, organics is not always that well understood. Uh, but I've asked Alan the hard questions about uh, the extent to which this is a philosophical decision and, and the extent to which it's uh, an economic one. Yeah. And while it's outside of my brief here with him, uh, he assures me that it stacks up economically. And when I look at the sort of performance that he's getting off this property and uh, do my own mental arithmetic about the impact that it's having on his costs, then my guess is that it probably stacks up pretty well for him. So it's clearly a long-term program, but, but somebody has to, has to lead the way, uh, and it's got to be someone with, with courage and thick skin, and, and, yeah. and Alan has those things. I don't think you go into these sort of things, you can't go into it blind and you also need a, someone who's um, had the experience and been there before so yeah we rely heavily on, on Robin's knowledge. Bit, uh, of a, bit of a mentor there. Yeah, he is a, a mentor too, yeah, yeah more than a mentor and it's, it's really important to have someone like that because it, sometimes it can be quite a lonely job yeah. when, you, when you're doing these things um, before your time perhaps in some cases yeah. and you need someone to, keep you, to help you keep, keep going on it. And of course also there's, there's uh, Sonia. Yeah, like science has been great because um, she's, she gives good advice at, at crucial times yeah. and, and you need that. Yeah. And um, yeah, I really um, respect her advice. And the and thing is, you know, she's got a real interest in the, in the genetics too. So we've actually got three, three heads working on it, not just one. Sonia Richardson, not always a farmy chick. No, no. Um, born and bred in Tauranga and yeah. um, moved down, oh, 96. Um, originally for six weeks and decided I quite liked it down here and um, so moved down and managed to get a job, lucky enough to get a job in Gore and stayed. And found a husband down here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> met Alan yeah. about a year later or so yeah. and um, yeah, and it's just sort of all gone from there really. Mm. Yeah. But you're not a uh, full time on the place here? No, I uh, work part time um, district nursing down in Gore, yeah. so um, yeah, enjoy, enjoy getting that people contact and yeah, just keeping my hand in with the nursing. Now the kids, they just love it here. Yes, yep. James is going to be a wee farm boy. Yep. And um, Grace really enjoys it as well. She's um, actually talking about becoming a vet. Yep. So, um, yeah, hopefully yeah, they'll come onto the farm at some stage. Now the sheep side of things, that, well, sheep and cattle with the genetics. Yeah. You, you love that side of things? Yep, now? Um, I usually help Alan when I can um, in the yards and, you know, going through studs, etc. So, yeah, and we have um, bounce ideas off each other and, and have frank discussions about, you know, what we should do and what we shouldn't do and yeah. and you know, what rams we're using etc so yeah it's great. Now the organic side of things yeah. was that underway when you got on the scene? We started farming organically about a year after we got married um, the year before we got married Alan had been and done a um, Kellogg's leadership course oh, yeah. and had done a project on the potential for organic farming in New Zealand and then just before we got married he applied to be an Uffield scholar and go overseas and study organics over there and so we got married, and then two months later he was away, off overseas. For a year? No, for six months. Oh, yeah. So um, he went away for a couple of months, and then I caught up with him for the last four months over there, and we travelled together and, and looked at organic operations over in, in Europe and yeah. what have you. So. Do you love the organic way of, of farming? Yeah. I, I don't think we'd have it any other way. I mean, we are what we eat, and if you're putting high inputs and chemicals into your um, animals, it gets stored in their fat and then you end up eventually eating that. So um, why not go chemical free or as chemical free as you can and um, have, a, have a healthier product. So we've spent a few days with you now, Alan. You might be organic, but you're, you're, you're not a mad greenie or anything like that, are you? You're not a crazy man. Well, I hope not, Tony. Um, obviously, with a hairdo like mine, I'm, I'm not your typical long haired greenie. <laughs> no. And, um, and yeah, at the end of the day, we're running a business here. Yeah. And the production system that we're using is organic. Yeah. Um, all the other key things there, the, the stock and pastures, we're just the same as anyone else. We're out to feed our stock as, as, as good as possible. So in the stud so, game for a long time now, also your father was the yeah. top man with the studs. Yeah. How do you see the future of, of the stud industry in New Zealand on the sheep side of things? Obviously the sheep industry is going to be a smaller industry than what we've had in the past. It's certainly going to be more focused, certainly more productive, and there's there's going to be a role for um, smaller studs such as ourselves. Yeah. And you know, probably some of the big boys think that they can um, supply all the genetics to to the whole country, but 
uh, that they're not doing everything and they can't do everything well. And, and certainly worm resistance, um, they've shied away from that because they don't want to um, put pressure on their animals and um, because they can't produce big fat animals um, to sell at the, at the end there. So there is a role for us, uh, we will be here and, and probably what we're doing will become more important to the industry rather than less in the future. For more information on the PGG Rights and Stud Tour, visit ruraltv.co.nz and come and join us on Facebook.